Uh, uh, what a blessing that is, huh? So, uh, <laughs> my, yeah, it's true. We are diehard Cowboys fans and diehard Crimson Tide fans. My wife answers the phone half the time. Roll Tide. You know, that's just how it goes. But uh, it's been a rough weekend. But the turkey was good, so we're, we're happy. Uh, I have to tell you, though, it's not just a depressing weekend. It's a little intimidating to stand here when our pastor really is the finest Bible teacher that walks the planet today. And so we're so great, so grateful, so grateful to have him as our pastor. And I'm truly honored that he would ask me to do this. Let me ask you something. If I were to tell you that there is a secret something out there that's been scientifically proven to increase your work performance, to increase your metabolism, to increase your energy, to increase your overall well-being, what if I told you it does not come in the form of a pill or a potion or a power drink? And what if I told you it's free? Would you want to know what it is? You want me to tell you? <laughs> I'll tell you later. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. This is a wonderful story that includes five major components of Christian living. It's a story about faith. It's a story about healing. It's a story about thanksgiving. It's a story about worship. And it's also one about salvation. But before we dive in, let me just put it in context for you. It is the winter of AD 32 when this moment takes place. And it's at the front end of Jesus' last journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. This is the final journey that he will take on his way to meet the cross. And so it's an emotional time for him. It's physically draining. It's a long journey. Along the way, he'll he'll. he'll perform many more miracles, many lives will be changed. But this story takes place sort of at the front end of that journey. And so we find there in chapter 17, verse 11, the first thing we see is a hopeless situation, a hopeless situation. Read in your Bibles there, verse 11. Now it happened as he went. Stop there for a second, because I love that phrase. I love that phrase because it just sort of encapsulates the idea of Jesus' ministry. Every day throughout his journeys, you constantly saw him in a, in a situation where he was interrupted. And it was in those little interruptions that he would change a life. He embraced the interruptions and used them to teach valuable lessons to all those around him. And I think this phrase is a really good reminder to all of us that God typically works his will in us through these same ways, through the mundane, everyday, as you go, as we, as he went type of moments. So I just want to encourage you, as you go throughout this next week, pay attention to the little interruptions. Sometimes God is using those to get your attention and to use you, perhaps, in a way to minister to somebody else. So verse 11, now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then as he entered... A certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers, who stood afar off. Now, Jesus and his disciples were traveling along the border of Samaria and Galilee, or perhaps they were just inside of it on the Samaritan side, when they happened upon this little village. And as most of you know, there was deep hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. It had been going on for hundreds of years, and traveling Jews would oftentimes go many miles out of the way just to avoid passing through Samaria. Uh, the Jews viewed Samaritans as impure because they were, in their minds, half-breeds. But not Jesus. His heart is for Jews and Samaritans and Gentiles alike, and he has no issue with traveling through this region. And one thing that's brought these 10 lepers together, they were both Jews and Samaritans alike, is that they all suffer from the same disease. They suffer from leprosy. Now, if you know anything about leprosy, you know that this is a very cruel disease. And leprosy in the Bible is referred to uh, it refers to any number of skin diseases, honestly, but the most feared and the most common was what we would call nowadays Hansen's disease. Leprosy caused a deterioration of the skin, and it makes its way to the extremities of the bodies, and joints and hands and feet eventually will lose their power, their function, and actually slowly deteriorate to nothing. It's a horribly painful and slow-moving degenerative disease. 
And it's first diagnosed with a notice of scores or, or sores or scabs or shiny white, red, and black patches. And it's always associated with ritual uncleanness. And it required separation from any contact with others. In fact, the law required in that day that they had to maintain 100 paces away from anyone else. And so when anybody was approaching, they were required, again, by law, to yell out, unclean, unclean, as a warning that they had been infected with leprosy and that they were extremely contagious. So leprosy was a devastating disease physically. And sometimes you could survive upwards of 50 years suffering physically with this disease. But it was also just as debilitating emotionally. Imagine being separated from your loved ones, no contact with anyone. It was debilitating socially and also psychologically. So if you had leprosy, you were, in essence, a dead man walking. Imagine being outcast to society, having a disease where there's no cure and no affection, no contact with loved ones, no future, no hope, no career, and yet life still lingers through all this desolation. Well, here these 10 lepers are. They've joined together in a colony for the sake of community and support, but also because they've been outcast together. And here they are standing a far ways off, and then we find in verse 13, they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. You know, it's interesting to me that Luke doesn't say they cried out with a loud voice. He simply says they lifted their voices. And I'll tell you why. Because leprosy creates hoarseness in your voice. You can't shout as a leper. You sound more like, uh, you know, the godfather. Hello! You know, that kind of sound. And so they were calling out to Jesus, calling him master, but with this hoarse voice. So it was more like a very, very loud whisper. They clearly understood who he was by calling him master. Or perhaps they've heard reports that he had even healed a leper earlier in his ministry. We find that story in Luke chapter 5 and also in Matthew chapter 8, which, by the way, was a very significant miracle because it truly showed Jesus was the Messiah. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, points out in chapters 35 and 53 that there was three significant miracles, messianic miracles, if you will, that had to take place for anybody to even be able to claim that they were Messiah. And the first of those miracles miracles was a Jewish leper being healed. Well, Jesus has already done it once, and now he's about to do it tenfold. In other words, he was showing the Jews and Samaritans alike that he truly is the Messiah, and yet so many fail to believe. However, these lepers, they're not interested in Messiahship at all. They just want mercy. They're crying out for pity. And I think ultimately what they really wanted was healing. So it's a heartbreaking scene. And it's a hopeless situation. But now I want you to see verse 14, the hopeful response. Verse 14 says, So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. Now they're crying out for mercy. Isn't this an interesting response? His response is, Go, show yourself to the priests. Now, any Jewish person in that day knew that if someone had leprosy, there was only one way you could re-enter society, and that was to go show yourself to the priest to prove to him that you have been, in fact, cleansed, that you have been healed from this disease, which, by the way, nowhere in Jewish record had ever actually happened. And so this would have been a first, except for what happened in Luke chapter 5, and so the process is very complicated and it's lengthy. You find it all there in Leviticus chapter 14, verses 1 through 32. It involves several sacrifices and it's required by law that the priest examine you in order to verify you have been healed. But at this point, the lepers haven't been healed. So they have a decision to make. What he's asking them to do is not necessarily a logical thing to do. You weren't supposed to go to the priest unless you'd been cleansed already. The priest isn't a doctor. So they're going to have to respond here in faith. And we see that they do. It's very inspiring how they respond. They simply believe and they go. And they begin to make their way towards the temple in faith. I think this is a great lesson for all of us to remember that there are many times in our lives, and I've lived through several recently, where we simply need to take steps of obedience in faith. Logic doesn't explain it. But when we sense the Lord is leading us, we need to take that step of faith. Because if we don't, we'll never know the joy of what's about to come next. 
So where proof is possible, faith is impossible. I love that word from John Ortberg. And listen to Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then listen to this quote from George Mueller. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. These lepers respond in faith. So we have this heartbreaking scene, and then we see their hopeful response. It's a response of faith. So is there anything practical we can learn from this? Well, I believe there is. Obedience to God begins with a small step of faith. Obedience to God begins with a small step of faith. So there's a hopeless situation. We see the hopeful response. Now let's look at their health being restored. I love the last part of verse 14. And so it was, it was as they went, there's that phrase again, that they were cleansed. I love that. The Bible indicates through its wording here that it was not a gradual thing, but that it happened suddenly, at once. I don't know how far the road they got towards the temple, but I know this, at once it happened. Can you just imagine the moment? Can you just imagine the excitement, the thrill in their hearts to look down and all of a sudden they, can, they have uh, fingers again, they have toes, they're walking normally again because they're not having to walk with a limp or a cane. God has healed them. He's cured them from this disease, but it, it's not just a physical healing that they, re, they receive. They received a cure from a disease which will actually give them their life back. They'll go back to their wives, their kids, their careers, their friends. So what's the takeaway in all this? Well, what do we learn? It's, it's very simple, but small steps of faith can lead to great works of God in our lives, as these 10 lepers all experienced. So there's this hopeless situation that we see. Then we see their hopeful response with faith. And then we see that God restores their health with just a spoken word. And then we see the happy return. Now, this is where we'll camp out just a little bit longer. I love this. I want you to look at verse 15 and read it closely with me. Luke 17, verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned. And with three choruses and one hymn and a little tip in the offering plate, gave a pittance of praise and moved along on his merry little way until the following weekend when he would do it all over again, unless a better option like a sports event or a social outing comes up, in which he would then delay his going back because those things take higher precedence than the one who changed his life forever. I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible says. Uh, uh, let, let, me, let me read what it actually says. It's in verse 15, it says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Wow, this is an emotional and a passionate reply to an indescribable, life-changing gift. And he returns and does two very obvious things. First of all, he worships Jesus, and then he thanks Jesus. Can I just tell you, worship and thanksgiving always go hand in hand. You cannot worship God without a heart of thanksgiving. Now, this man has experienced something unbelievable, and his response is the right one. It's a response of worship. And worship is just that. It's a response to all that God has given to us, all that God has done in us and through us. And we do it in two different ways. You see, worship is sort of a two-sided coin, if you will. There is individual worship, and then there's corporate worship. Now, what you do Sunday mornings, like we are gathered here today, this is what we call corporate worship. We're all together worshiping the Lord, singing our songs of praise, giving in our offerings and all these things, and then hearing from the Word. But individual worship is what happens on Monday morning when you step out of your bed. Do you step into His presence? Are you practicing individual worshiper? worship? I'm, I'm convinced, folks, the reason we have a nation full of dead churches is because we have a bunch of corporate worshipers who come and fulfill their hour for the week, but we don't have individual worshipers sitting out here. You know what makes powerful corporate worship? A group of individual worshipers who've spent time with the Lord throughout the week, who've fallen in love with Jesus, who live for him Monday through Saturday, and then we join together in this room on Sunday morning, and it should be shouting hallelujah time, folks. That's the way it should be. But the reason we don't have that 
is because we've never equated the two as needing each other. You see, both cannot survive without the other. We need both corporate worship and individual worship. And this man makes an individual response to come back to Jesus. He's by himself. Can you imagine that? There's 10 lepers with him. All 10 get healed. Only one comes back. You would think, just from the sheer length of the travel to the temple, one of his buddies would have said, I'll go with you. But no, he comes back alone. Oh, sure, he'll eventually have to make his way to the temple, go through the ritual with the priest, and be cleared for re-entrance back into society, but not before he does what he needs to do first. He gives the glory and the honor to the only one who's worthy of it. And this brings up a little practice that I like to call in my life the principle of firsts. I follow these principles in my life, and they have proved to be so helpful and so life-changing for me. Here's the principle of first for me. Every dime of every dollar goes to the Lord. Every first moment of every day goes to the Lord. I try not to even step out of my bed before I just look to the ceiling and say, thank you, Lord. It's amazing how if you just start everything with the first with the Lord, the first day of the week, it's the Lord's. If you begin to practice that principle in your life, it's amazing how practical it becomes and how life-changing it can be. So our first response in all things should be, thanks be unto the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18 is a great verse, and I love it. It says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I told the last service, I looked up that word everything in the Greek. You know what it means? (laughs) Everything. I mean, it means bad and good. In everything, give thanks. Why? Because he's worthy. He's worthy. Listen to Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Did you ever think about that? You weren't just created by Jesus, folks. You were created for Jesus. That's the reason you exist, to worship him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, he may have the preeminence. Oh, folks, I love those verses because they place Jesus as the central figure in all of history. They place Jesus where he belongs, at the top of the pyramid of time and space and history and humanity. And it's under Jesus that all things exist. It was by Jesus that all things were created. It is because of Jesus that hope abounds and grace is abundant. All things and all people are behind him and beneath him. He's the master and the ruler over all of creation, and he stands at the head of the table of time. He's the first, the last, and everything in between. He is preeminent savior and powerful king. Nothing and no one is before him, and one day every knee will bow and proclaim him as Lord of lords and king of kings. He is worthy whether you choose to worship him or not. But I suggest you do (laughs) because he holds your future in his hands. So this man comes back, but he doesn't just come back walking and he doesn't just come back with a whisper. Verse 15 says he comes back and with a loud voice glorified God. Now, if you've ever heard me sing, you know I love this verse. I like to sing loud. I like it loud. I like everything loud. When we watch the Alabama games, it's loud. Everything's loud in my house. We like it loud. I used to have a shirt that said, real men sing real loud. (laughs) This curate leopard suddenly didn't care about ritual. He didn't care about how he looked. He didn't care who was watching. He didn't care how he sounded, for he had been cured. Oh, Uh, that we would be kind of believers in this church and beyond that this man had become. May we sing songs of praise with reckless abandon. May we shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. May we lose the garments of traditionalism and get rid of the trappings of legalism and simply worship Jesus with a pure heart that has been cleansed by God. You know, one thing that's interesting to me is that there are Christians, and I run into them all over the place, who have been set free by the grace of the Lord. They've been saved, and yet they live as though they haven't been. 
Their worship is dull and stagnant. And I'll tell you why that's the case in so many lives. It's because we've replaced our worship of the king with something or someone else. But this lone leper knew exactly who deserved his praise. So he comes back and he's shouting. And his motive is not attention, it's affection. Now, I realize that not all of us are shouters. Not all of us are hand raisers. I looked around this morning. Some of you are worshiping the Lord like this. Others of you are worshiping the Lord like this. Now, it's not up to me to determine whether or not you're worshiping the Lord or not. That's between you and the Lord. He knows your heart. So, we're all different. But I will say this. If you're wanting to praise the Lord in a certain way and you don't, then perhaps you should. My mom is really funny. She's five foot one and she's about 98 pounds. And we had had a particular powerful worship service this one morning and afterwards we went to lunch and she was sitting there and she goes, oh honey, because she never calls me my name. I've just been honey my whole life. <laughs> she said, honey, I thought that worship experience was so powerful this morning. I mean, I... I almost lifted my hands. Uh, I said, well, Mom, you don't want to get out of control here. I mean, this is a little... Well, the fact is, you know, some people are just more stoic. They're more reserved. But let's be careful not to confuse reverence with rigor mortis, right? And I'm not talking about worshiping out of control, just out of coma, for crying out loud. All right? So even if you're a true introvert, it should never keep you from expressing your worship to him in some way, shape, or form. Remember, it's the collective body of Christ, all worshiping in our individual way, that creates a magnificent symphony of praise to our creator. And that sound is the song of the redeemed, and it's a beautiful and lovely sound in the ears of our creator. Yes, it is. So we don't have to sing as one voice in unison, but we must worship with one heart in unity. Worship's not about a style, folks. It's about a savior. And it's not about our preferences. It's about being in his presence. And worship comes in many forms. And I will say the most sacrificial forms are not with our singing of songs. It's with our time and our talent and with our treasures. So worship does come in many forms, but... At the heart of it all is thankfulness. Thankfulness. Martin Luther was once asked to describe the nature of true worship, and here was his response the tenth leper turning back. I love that. So, this leper, he's cured. So, he comes back and he worships Jesus, and then he thanks Jesus. Psalm 100, verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the gate by which we encounter the presence of the Lord. And the Lord reminds us in his, in his word in Psalm chapter 50, verse 23, giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. If you keep to my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. I love that word. Now, at the beginning of this message, I told you there's this secret something, the secret sauce in life that science has proven will give you better health and a sharper mind. You'll sleep better and eat better. And it's free. You want to know what it is? All right, I'll tell you. You probably guessed it. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. Can you believe it? But it's true. Do you realize, and I, and I verified this on the World Wide Web, and you know everything you re read on the web is true, right? So you got to... <laughs> but I verified this. Literally, hundreds of studies have been done. Millions of dollars have been spent on discovering what happens to your brain when you have an attitude of gratitude. You remember that old commercial, this is your brain on drugs, and then they throw that? Yeah. Well, this is your brain on gratitude, all right? 
discovered by just one of many doctors, but this is Dr. Alex Korb from UCLA. This is his words. The wide variety of effects that gratitude can have may seem surprising, but a direct look at the brain activity during gratitude yields some insight. A study from the National Institutes of Health examined blood, blood flow in various brain regions while some subjects, uh, while subjects summoned up feelings of gratitude. They found that subjects who showed more gratitude overall had higher levels of activity in the hypothalamus. Now this is important because the hypothalamus is the part of your brain which controls a huge array of essential bodily functions, including eating, drinking, and sleeping. It also has a huge influence on your metabolism and your stress levels. So from this evidence on brain activity, it starts to become clear how improvements in gratitude could have such wide-ranging effects from increased energy and exercise to improved sleep to decreased depression and fewer aches and pains. Who knew? Isn't that cool? <laughs> so let me sum it up for you. If you want to lose weight quicker, be thankful. And that comes with a certain amount of discipline. You understand that, right? I mean, you, you, you can't hold up a hostess Twinkie and say, thank you, Lord, and then chow down on it. That's not how it works. I know some of you tried that over Thanksgiving meal, too. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for this apple pie a la mode. Now I'm going to throw down on it. No, that's not how it works. You want to sleep better? Be thankful. You want to increase metabolism? Literally, be thankful. So you got some homework this week. I'm assigning you homework. I want you to go home and make a list of 100 things that you're thankful for. Now, that sounds like a lot until you realize just how much you're blessed. Think about it. If we have food in the refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the people in this world. Do you realize that if you have any money in the bank, any at all, cash in your wallet, spare change in a dish someplace that you are among the top 8% of the earth's wealthiest people? Do you realize that if you made a, a, just $1,500 or, or, or less last year, just $1,500, that you are in the top 20% of the world's income earners? See, folks, it's not happy people who are thankful. It's thankful people who are happy. And it doesn't matter if the glass is half empty or half full. Be grateful that you have a glass and there's something in it. I love what my friend Clayton King said. He says, thankfulness is a decision before it's a discipline. And thankfulness is an action before it's an attitude. So I'm encouraging you to take an action towards an attitude of gratitude. Alphonse Carr has one of my favorite statements. He said this, some people are always grumbling because roses have thorns. Well, I'm thankful that thorns have roses. I love that. That's a great picture of an attitude of gratitude. So if you're kind of thinking in your head, now what would I put on that list? Let me just get you started. You ready? You're breathing. Hello. Your heart is beating. You woke up this morning from a soft bed, most likely. And you're in San Diego, California, for crying out loud. I mean, how much better does that get? You got up and perhaps you stumbled to the coffee maker. You have a coffee maker. You have coffee to put in the maker. Then you put clothes in your closet, in, in your, on your back from your closet that you have. You put shoes on your feet. Most of you took a shower, praise God. <laughs> with warm running water. And you had the privilege of brushing your teeth and then you probably got in a car and made your way to church and then you may have made an additional stop at Starbucks to pay an additional $6 for an additional cup of coffee and you had the $6 to buy it. Do you see what I'm saying? On and on and on and on it could go. Every moment of our lives, we can thank Jesus for it, folks. We are so very blessed, aren't we? We are. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And listen, that's just the physical stuff. What about all the spiritual providing that he does for us? What about our relationships? Uh, the, the gift of mental health? All these things. I mean, we could just go on and on and on. So count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. I didn't share this in the other two services, but I also found a great quote from the great theologian Willie Nelson. 
who said, when I started counting my blessings, my whole life turned around. I thought to myself, he probably wrote that while he was on the road again. But uh, <laughs> sorry, that was, <laughs> now you know why I didn't share it in the other two services. But anyway, so what's our takeaway? Let me give you this, all right? Obedience to God begins with a small step of faith. And then small steps of faith can lead to great works of God in our lives. And then thirdly, God deserves our praise and our thanksgiving for those daily works he does in and through each of our lives. So we see the hopeless situation. We've seen the hopeful response. We've witnessed that their health has been restored. Now we've seen this happy return. Let me give you one more. The healing completed. The healing has been completed. Luke chapter 17, verses 17 and 18. So Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Now, this is both a joyous and a sad part of the story. I love the words that Pastor David Wilkerson shares here. Listen to this, what he has to say about these nine lepers. For years to come, these nine lepers would have a powerful testimony. They would spend the rest of their lives talking about how Jesus merely spoke a word and they were healed. And you can almost hear their story, can't you? I was once a leper. I was all alone with no hope, dirty, filthy, lost, a dying man. And then Jesus came along and cleansed me. I've been healed now for 25 years. Praise his name. Well, that all sounds wonderful, but the problem was that they were talking about a man they did not know, witnessing to the power of a Savior they knew nothing of. They only saw him afar off. They could tell you what he looked like. They could tell you what he sounded like. They could tell you how he walked. But they never got near to him and to his heart. See, those other nine represent for us an ungrateful spirit. They were happy to be healed, but not grateful enough to come back. They gladly received a cure, but they failed to re return to Christ. Oh, I'm sure they were thankful, but I love what William Ward said. He said this, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. Maybe we should express our thankfulness a little more often. And this foreigner, this Samaritan, that's exactly what he did. He was one of the despised, a marginalized member of society. But I've discovered usually the most thankful are the ones who've been rescued from the most desperate situations. So where are the other nine? Well, they still exist today in every pew and every church, on planes and buses and neighborhoods, maybe under your own roof, perhaps in front of you in the mirror. And who are the other nine? Well, we all are at times. I've I've been there many times. And I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about worship. Do you remember a time in your life when you would respond to Jesus like this one Samaritan did? Was there a time when you were a white-hot worshiper of him and, and you would passionately praise him throughout the week and in church because you were walking with him and growing in him daily? But now, perhaps years later, it almost feels like drudgery. There's no fire in your belly for God. There's no hunger for his word. Where did it go? Perhaps you've lost your attitude of gratitude. You know, I, uh, I'm a big fan of sweet tea. My wife makes great sweet tea. She's from Alabama, wrote that. And because of that, she makes great sweet tea. And one time she had made some sweet tea and I went to the refrigerator, grabbed it and was going to pour it in a big glass and I was excited about this moment and I took a big swallow of that sweet tea and it was not sweet tea at all. It was incredibly bitter, ugh, you know, like unsweet tea is in my mind. And I said, honey, I thought, you, I thought you put sugar in the tea. She said, I did. She said, well, maybe I just didn't stir it up. And I looked at the bottom of that thing, and there it was, all the sugar resting at the bottom. You know, technically, it was sweet tea. But practically and realistically, it wasn't sweet at all. I just wonder how many of you have lost the joy of your salvation because somewhere along the way, you got so comfortable in your Christianity that you allowed Jesus just to settle to the bottom of your life. There's no fire there anymore. 
Perhaps it's because you've lost that attitude of gratitude. So let me implore you to go back and rediscover the goodness of God in your life and begin to thank God for all things. So after all this, he says to him in the last verse, verse 19, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus cured this man of a cruel disease. He cured him physically and emotionally. But now we're going to see that he doesn't just cure this man, he heals him also. Did you know that there's a difference between being cured and being healed? In verse 14, this Samaritan man was cured from leprosy along with the other nine. But when he returned to Christ, he received much more than just a cure. He was healed. You see the word for well, that last word in that verse, your faith has made you well? It's the Greek word sozo. And it carries much deeper and much broader meaning than just a physical healing from a disease. It means quite literally that he was saved. I love that. He is made whole, complete. This man was saved because he came back to Christ. Now, often the words healing and curing are used interchangeably, but their definitions could not be more different. You see, curing is a restoration of health, an absence of symptoms, and a remedy of a disease. Healing, on the other hand, is a restoration of wholeness, not the level of wholeness before the diagnosis, but a restoration of wholeness that is new, different, and comparatively better than before the onset of disease. So it's not just a removal of the symptoms. Healing is rather an integrative process that transcends the physical and includes mental, emotional, and spiritual vitality and wellness. I love that. Have you ever experienced the difference between being cured and being healed? I close with this. In October 1942, World War II was claiming the lives of millions around the globe. And Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was on a mission in a B-17 bomber to deliver an important message to General Douglas MacArthur in New Guinea. But there was an unexpected detour which would hurl Captain Eddie into the most harrowing adventure of his life. Somewhere over the South Pacific, the flying fortress became lost beyond the reach of radio. Fuel ran out, so the men were forced to ditch their plane in the ocean. And for nearly a month, Captain Eddie and his companions would fight the the water, the weather, and the scorching sun. And they spent many sleepless nights recoiling as giant sharks rammed their rafts. But of all their enemies at sea, the most formidable was starvation. Eight days out, their rations were already gone, long gone, destroyed by the salt water, and it would take a miracle to sustain them. And then a miracle occurred. As Captain, in Captain Eddie's own words, listen to what he said. Captain William Cherry read the service that afternoon, and we finished with a prayer for deliverance and a hymn of praise. And there was some talk, but it tapered off in the oppressive heat With my hat pulled down over my eyes to keep out some of the glare, I simply dozed off. And then something landed on my head. I knew that it was a seagull. I don't know how I knew. I just knew. Everyone else knew too. No one said a word. But peering out from under my hat brim without moving my head, I could see the expression on their faces. They were staring at that seagull. (laughs) That goal meant food if I could catch it. And the rest, as they say, is history. Captain Eddie caught that seagull. Its flesh was eaten. The rest of its remains were used as bait to catch fish. And the survivors were sustained and their hopes renewed because of a lone seagull, uncharacteristically hundreds of miles from land, offered itself as a sacrifice. Captain Eddie and the rest of the crew had made it. And he never forgot. Because every Friday evening... Until his death in 1973, at about sunset, on a lonely stretch along the eastern Florida seacoast, you could see an old man walking, white-haired, bushy-eyebrowed, slightly bent. His bucket would be filled with shrimp to feed the seagulls, to remember that one which, on a long day past, gave itself without a struggle and saved his life. Captain Eddie remained grateful his entire life and never forgot the sacrifice of that seagull. Maybe today you feel like Captain Eddie did on that tiny little raft. You feel like you're lost. You feel like you're drifting in an ocean of doubt or in a sea of hopelessness. 
And you've tried every which way to rescue yourself, but you've come to the place where you know that you cannot do this on your own. Can I just remind you that there is one on a day long past who gave himself up without a struggle in order to save your soul. His name, folks, is Jesus. And the fact is we're all born with this degenerative disease, and it's way worse than leprosy could ever think about being. It's the disease of sin, and it's the greatest killer of all. All of us are born with this, and there's only one hope. There's only one hope for the healing and the restoration and the rescuing of us out of this sin, and it's Jesus. All ten men were cured, but only one was completely healed. He was the only one who experienced the healing touch of Jesus both inside and out. So he went back to Jesus, and Jesus was there for him. I wonder... How many of you realize that Jesus is here for you too? If you're lost, he's the way. If you're searching, search no longer, he's the truth. And if you're hopeless, he's the only one who can make you whole. And for those of us who are believers in this room, maybe you met the Lord a long time ago. Somewhere along the way, he just sort of settled down at the bottom. And your heart isn't in fire for him like it is. I want to encourage you. Come back to him. Come back to him. Rediscover what it is to be thankful. Rediscover a heart of gratitude. Because at the very essence of worship is always thankfulness. When the music fades, all is stripped away. And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's a word That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have you search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry 